If you have your Bibles, I want us to go to two different places. We're going to go to the book of Proverbs, chapter number 3, and also 1 Timothy, chapter number 6. Proverbs, chapter number 3, and then 1 Timothy, chapter number 6. I have a thought that God laid on my heart here recently, a few days ago, and I have some good material that I... That I studied out and that God dropped in my spirit and for the sake of time I need to try to do my best not to chase rabbits and uh, so y'all pray for pastor amen, amen because I want to be mindful of the time but I think that you'll enjoy this and I think that this will be a blessing and a help to you tonight Proverbs chapter number three and verse number five if you're there say praise the Lord praise the Lord Trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? All. All thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. That's a hard thing to do. Yeah. It's easy to say, and it's a hard thing to do. To trust God wholeheartedly, completely, and do not lean on what makes sense to you. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. First Timothy chapter number six. First Timothy chapter number six and verse number twenty. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called which some professing have erred concerning the faith grace be with thee amen notice what he says to Timothy he, he says avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called which some professing have erred concerning the faith with the help of the lord i want to teach us and talk to us tonight on this thought flawed faith flawed faith amen let's lift our hands and go to the lord in prayer lord we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy thank you for the opportunity to be here in the house of the Lord, to you worship you, to enter into your presence. You Ask you, Lord, that for the next little bit, Lord, you would guide my words. Lord, I pray that you would anoint me, anoint the preaching and the teaching of your word. Lord, minister to every life, every need, and every situation here tonight. That you alone would receive all the glory and all the praise. Lord, keep your hand upon destiny. Keep your hand upon Tristan and upon baby Ava. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Somebody say flawed faith. Flawed faith. Man, what is a flaw? Anybody know? In your own words? An imperfection. An imperfection? Anybody it's, else? Yeah. An uh-oh. An uh-oh? A mishap. Yeah. Mishap? Okay. Very good. The word faith is found 336 times in the King James Version Bible. So what is faith? Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1 tells us that now faith is. Somebody say, this is what it is. This is what, what it is. is. The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. See, with faith... It's the substance of things hoped for. You're hoping for something. And you're laying all your eggs in one basket. You're wholeheartedly committed. You're completely invested in an outcome that you cannot see. That's faith. That's why the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Flawed faith results when people try to 
say, I trust God, but they still lean to their own intellect and their own uh, level of comprehension. And it's, it's a matter of if I can see it, if I can just somehow make sense of it, if I can just somehow lay a hold of it and, and hold it in my hands and feel my way through this, then, then uh, I'll be able to navigate my way forward. But flawed faith is simply not trusting God with all your heart, but it is leaning to your own understanding. So why is faith important? Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 2 through, two through 3 tells us that for by it, the elders obtained a good report. If you want to have a good report, a good testimony, a good record with God, you must have faith. You absolutely must have faith. The Bible talks to us, and I don't want to get off on this too deep tonight. We'll talk about it another time, but there are some books that God holds in heaven. One of these is called the Lamb's Book of Life. Some people erroneously uh, and unscripturally think that when a person is born into this world, like baby Ava should be born tomorrow, that, that Ava's name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that is absolutely not true. Your name is recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life when you are born again, the new birth experience. Amen. And so there is that book. There is also a group of books, and Revelation doesn't tell us the number of these books, but if you study it out, I believe that you will come to the same conclusion as I and most other apostolic preachers that it's the 66 books of the Bible that the books are opened and everybody's going to give an account for their lifestyle choices out of these books. In other words, the teacher is going to open the teacher's manual and start grading our tests. And the answers to life's test, the measurement of our life is going to be compared against the Word of God. It does not matter what media says doesn't matter what your peers and your friends and your family says. doesn't matter what your traditions. doesn't matter your neighbor's beliefs. doesn't matter what's culturally appropriate or relevant at the time. It only matters what the Word of God has to say. And if our, if our lives do not line up with the Word of God, I can assure you that God is keeping a record. The Bible tells us that... Uh, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Now, you see, at the rapture of the church, the dead in Christ, they're not in heaven yet. They're not walking on streets of gold. That is a uh, Baptist and a Methodist theology that has somehow found its way into the apostolic church, but they are in a place of peace and rest. Jesus kind of gave us uh, this terminology. You can refer to it as Abraham's bosom. They are at, at peace. They are at rest. They are being comforted. They are, they are with the Lord, but they're not walking on streets of gold in heaven yet. Okay? They are the dead in Christ. And what are, and what are they doing? They're waiting for the sound of the last trump. And Paul tells us that at the sound of the last trump, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to happen that fast. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So you got to dissect all this. If they were already in heaven, and I know there's a lot of apostolic shaking their head at me, and they, they disagree with this, and I can't help it. That's what the Bible says. And if you don't agree with what the Bible says, you're wrong. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. You would not have to meet the Lord in the air if you were already with him. Right. You, you know, you explain this to me. If you think that that great grandma, uh, you know, is is walking on streets of gold and she's already got her starry crown and her reward, why? Uh, if she's already in heaven, how is she going to meet the Lord in the air at His coming? Right. Are you apostolic theologians? You tell me that. She's in a place of peace and comfort and rest in Abraham's bosom, waiting. For Jesus to split the clouds of glory. That's right. And then great grandma, our Eustace is going to come out of the ground in a glorified body, and we which are alive and remain 
those who are full of the Holy Ghost, ready to meet the Lord, we are going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And together, those that had died in Christ and those that were immediately translated from a living state to a new glorified body were going to heaven together at the same time. I'm going to prove that to you. I preached on Sunday that the bridegroom came at a set hour. Now, those that were meant to be part of the bride were waiting on the other side of the door. Not inside the door, outside the door. Am I, am I in the book? There were ten virgins. Five wise, five foolish. You know the story. I preached on a Sunday. No need to rehash the story. Five foolish didn't have oil in their lamps. They could not go. The five that had oil in their lamps, it was trimmed and burning. They went out to meet the bridegroom. When the announcement was made, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now, Jesus has given the analogy of the rapture of the church here. That's right. That's right. Now, all you apostolic theologians with your, your pedigrees and all your other degrees, and more degrees than a thermometer, you prove to me that I'm wrong right here. Okay? Those that were ready to meet the Lord had to go meet him when the declaration was made, here he comes. That's right. They were not already with him. That's right. That's right. They had to go meet him. Acts chapter 1, the angels say, Why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus is coming back and back in like manner as you've seen him go away. He's coming back in the clouds. And Paul tells us that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that the dead in Christ are going to rise, the living are going to be immediately translated, we're going to meet the Lord in the air together. That's right. Now that's what the Bible says. Amen. So I'm sorry. Amen. Great Grandma Eustace is not walking on the streets of gold yet. And I said all that to say this, nobody has received their reward yet. The reward happens when the rapture takes place. And those of us that are ready to meet the Lord, whether you're dead or living, we, we meet the Lord in the air. We make our triumphant entry into heaven. And we are going to a award ceremony. Because the Bible says the books are open and... We're going to be judged out of the books according to our works. This is not the final judgment where people are thrown into the lake of fire, but those uh, people are going to receive different levels of rewards according to our lifestyle choices here and now. That's why people who say, all you need is faith and good works is irrelevant. Well, okay, if you want to sit on the bench and be the towel boy and the water jug holder in heaven, okay. But if you'd rather be on the basketball court dunking the basketball like MJ up in heaven, uh, you know, my, my little analogy, then you probably need to do some good works down here, and that is adhering to the Word of God. Amen. That's right. If you're going to be part of the bride of Christ, amen, there's an award ceremony as soon as the rapture takes place. And there's another award ceremony. It's actually not an award ceremony. It's the final day of judgment that happens at the end of the millennial reign. Revelations tells us that the dead, the sea gives up the dead. All of those who do not go to heaven in the rapture, all of the dead are called up, and, they, and all of the living, and they stand before God. And when their name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, this is how we know that your name is not written in that book the moment that you're just naturally born. Because if it was recorded in that book when you were naturally born, then your name would be in the book. But the Bible tells us that they are looking for your name, and when your name is not found there, then you're cast into the lake of fire with the devil and his angels that are going to be tossed in first. Now, why would your name not be put in the Lamb's Book of Life? It, it, it's not recorded until you're born again. That's right. That's right. I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand how people have such a struggle seeing that, but, but you hear it in apostolic pulpits and churches all across the globe People listening to different religious theologies and they get themselves confused. I prefer to stick with what the book has to say. That's right. Amen. And so, faith, by faith, the, the elders received a good report. And if you want a good report with God, you've got to have faith. Amen. It also says that through faith, we understand. Tell your neighbor, say, We understand. We understand. 
we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. It doesn't just say world. It's got an S on the end of it. Worlds. Now, I'm going to get into something here in just a minute. And I, there's a lot of rabbit trails I could chase with all that, but I can't for the sake of time. But let me just tell you something. Uh, the Bible that we have, the Word of God that we have, is God's love letters, God's plan of redemption and desire to have fellowship and relationship with humanity. And it only is descriptive of heaven and the earth and the first, second, and third heaven. It deals with us right here. It does not talk at all about Pluto, Saturn, and Jupiter, and Mars, the Andromeda galaxy that has a planet identical to Earth, only like five times larger. They have spotted with the Hubble telescope that there are several galaxies, and there are planets filling these galaxies, and moons, and suns, and everything's in orbit just like ours. Things in perfect orbit and perfect array, perfect structure. And someone says, well, why is all that out there? Why is that out Let me tell you, God never does anything just because. There's always a reason for everything he does. Now, I can tell you that none of those planets and solar systems pertain to our salvation and what this book here, the Word of God, tells us and how to live for God and how to make ourselves ready for the coming of the Lord. But there are stories of other worlds. That's right. That's what Hebrews say. That's right. People say, I don't believe all of that. I'm sorry that you have a lack of faith. That's right. Because through faith you understand. Now, I didn't say that. The unnamed writer of Hebrews that we perceive is most likely Paul said, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen we're not made of things which do appear. Some people go through life constantly searching for the answer to mysteries of the universe and the origins and the meaning of life. And these people are, they continue, continually search and are never able to find the answers to the questions that they seek. But Paul describes people just like this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 7. He says, They are ever learning. And never able to come to the knowledge of truth. That's right. Paul also writes about the perfect will of God for every person. Tell your neighbor, say that means you. That means you. That means you. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. It is the perfect will of God for every man, woman, and child to be saved and make heaven their home. Right. That's right. And to come to the knowledge of truth. That's right. He wants us to be saved and he wants us to know truth. That's right. And those are two different things. That's right. Although they are integrated and connected, they're not one and the same. That's right. So how do we get to that place of coming to the knowledge of truth? Scientists often look to scientific methods and Search for answers that lead to ultimate conclusions of alleged truth. Now, I've always had a fascination with astronomy. From a young kid, I, I, I know that when I was in elementary school, I was a young kid, I used to dream of wanting to be an astronaut. And uh, I wanted to ride a space shuttle, and I wanted to go up into space, and, and I wanted to experience circling Earth and the space shuttle and getting on the International Space Station and maybe even one day being, uh, you know, able to set uh, my, my feet on the moon. I, I dreamed of that as a little kid. And, uh, of course, we know that the percentage of people that ever get to be an astronaut is very minute. That's right. It's harder, <laughs> check this out, it's harder to become an astronaut than it is to become a Navy SEAL. It's harder to become a scientific explorer of space than it is to be an elite killer for the military. That's right. <laughs> Ain't that something? It's true. But I love astronomy, the study of 
the sun, the moon, the stars, planets, comets, gas, galaxies, dust, and other non-earthly bodies and phenomena. It fascinates me just like it apparently fascinated King David. In Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 through 4, David said, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? David had something here that I think blows over us sometimes. He realized, he said, we've got a sun, we've got a moon, we've got countless stars. We see with the naked eye, he didn't even have a, a Hubble telescope, just with the naked eye out there in the field, you know, keeping the sheep. Just as far as his eyes could see, he was astonished at what God had created. And he says, what is humanity in the grand scheme of all of this? What are we? We're just a little speck of dust. But I think sometimes we get so puffed up and so full of ourselves that we think that it's really all about us. And that's why I think a lot of times we miss a lot of revelation in the Word of God and we, we, we skip over and we outright reject things if it doesn't correlate with that, that, that kind of arrogance of, that it's all about us. Amen. It's not about us. Amen. It's always been about Him. That's that's right. Right. Always been about Him. And so David acknowledged that. David uh, respected that. Now, the Apostle Paul also writes about the sun and the moon and the stars. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verse 41, he says, there was one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differed from an, another star in glory. He was saying that there was a there was a appearance and a purpose and an intentional placing of every one of these in the galaxy. God designed it. God mapped it out. God planned it. God made it happen. God ordained and created it all. He said the sun doesn't look like the moon. The moon doesn't look like the sun. The stars don't look like the moon or the sun. They've all got a purpose. They've all got a place. And God just put them all out there the way he wanted them. But he did not stop with the Milky Way. He did not stop with our galaxy. He went over... Uh, farther than we could ever travel in a human's lifetime, and he created the Andromeda galaxy that's got even more planets and more stars and more solar systems than ours. The closest planet that looks almost just like Earth, from what we can tell, is five times the size of this one. Now, why did God create that? We will probably never know, but God's got a reason. Right. Hebrews tells us through faith we understand it. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have it all mapped out. You don't have to have the, the answer logically and scientifically just through faith. You know that God created it, God put it out there, and God's got a reason for it. That's right. And that's all we need to know. That's through right. faith, we understand He created the world. That's right. Not just earth, the world. That's right. I personally believe in other galaxies and other solar systems and other planets, God's got other people. And other, uh, other plans ordained for them. I do not believe that in this gigantic universe and with neighboring galaxies and all of this, I, I really think it's a, a, a almost an American level arrogance. And that's arrogant right there. We are an arrogant people. I love America, but we are probably the most arrogant people on the face of this entire planet. Now you have to admit that and say amen. We think that we are the stuff and everybody else is beneath us. Come on now. Not even a single amen. 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 But we think it's all about us. And, and people, I think that they think that uh, just because they can see humanity here on planet Earth that this is all there is. I don't think so. I'm not talking about little green men with antennas and, and the alien species, but God created other worlds. That's right. Hebrews tells us he did. And science has proven that he did. 
And we may not understand why, and it doesn't pertain to us, obviously. That's another book and another story for another group of people. But it's out there. And Hebrews says through faith we can understand that. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter number 1 tell, talks in great detail of creating the universe. And verse 14 through 16 of Genesis chapter 1, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser to rule the night. He made the stars also. So notice what Moses is recording here that God has uttered and declared. Genesis chapter 1, he says that the sun and the moon and the stars are going to be for signs and for seasons. So they're not just up there to look pretty. The sun's not just up there to give us light in the daytime and the moon to look pretty at night and the stars, you know, for you to lay out and have a picnic at midnight thinking, oh, isn't that beautiful, the little dipper. They've all got a purpose. God hung every last one of the stars exactly where he wanted them. That's right. And every last one of them has a purpose. You heard me say this Sunday, but you're coming up here just, uh, I believe it's Monday next week, that for the first time in well over, I don't know, it was a thousand or something years, that the, the star of Bethlehem is going to be visible. That all of the... The, the galaxy, everything's going to align just so. And if you're not in a large city that's clouded with smog and a lot of artificial lights, you will be able to see the star of Bethlehem. The same star that led the wise men and the shepherds, right? When Jesus was born. None of this is coincidence, guys. That's right. God declared in the very beginning, the first chapter of the Word of God, it's going to be for signs and for seasons. That's now look at this. So God clearly laid out the fact that the sun and the moon and the stars would be looked to for signs and information. Over the centuries, we've learned that the moon is 2,038, 238,900 miles from Earth. That's just a skipper on the block. While the sun is significantly farther away at 91,479 million miles from Earth. The moon orbits the earth at an average speed of 2,300 miles an hour. And we've learned that the gravitational forces of the moon have a direct impact on the ocean's tides, the coral reefs, the migration and navigation pattern of birds, and much, much more. But nothing is more important to us on earth than the sun, because without the sun's heat and light, the earth would be a lifeless ball of ice. The sun warms our seas, stirs our atmosphere, generates our weather patterns, gives energy to green growing plants, and provides food and oxygen to sustain life here on earth. God did all of that for a reason. That's right. Jesus spoke about the ability of mankind to discern and predict weather patterns based upon the signs of the sky. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 2 through 3, he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather today. For the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the sign of the times? I don't know how many times I've read this, and I never really saw this until recently. Jesus was talking about signs. They wanted to know, uh, you know, what are some things for us to look for, Lord? The, the disciples asked Jesus plainly in another passage. They said, what are the signs that the temple here in Jerusalem is going to be destroyed? What are some signs of your coming back? And what are some signs of the end of the world? Three different things. And I believe that's Matthew chapter 24 
have to go back and, and, and double check my reference there. So they wanted to know three different things, and Jesus begins to give them some things to look for, give us some things to look for. We know that the temple of Jerusalem was already raised and destroyed a long time ago. Jesus has not yet come back. So the signs he gave them to look for is relevant to us today. And he does give us this caution and warning. He says, watch therefore, for you know not the day or the hour that the Son of Man cometh. He's coming as a thief in the night. He's coming at an hour when you think not. And so we must be ready and we must be vigilant and watching. Amen. And so some signs at the end of the world, he gives us some more uh, details about all of that, and that's all relevant as well. However, the rapture of the church is going to take place, I believe, right before the great tribulation and the kingdom of the Antichrist. And so we're already going to be caught out of here. We're going to be in a glorified body. We're going to come back and rule and reign with Christ here on earth for a thousand years in the millennial reign. And then you're going to have the final battle, and everything's going to come to a final conclusion. Is what we refer to as the end of the world. So I ain't worried about all of that. Because even when it gets here, I plan on being in an eternal, immortal, glorified body, ruling and reigning with Christ. Amen. So I'm not worried about the end of the world. That's right. What I'm focused on, and what you and I should be focused on, is not the Bible of Battle of Armageddon, not the end of the world, not how the world's going to burn up and be destroyed with a fervent heat, as Peter describes, but being ready for the coming of the Lord, right. the rapture of the church. That's what we're looking for. That's what we need to make sure that we're ready for. And Jesus says here, he said, I've taught you a long time ago, all the way back in Genesis chapter number one, that the sun and the moon and the stars would be navigational tools. They can impart certain levels of information if you study them out that would be for signs and for seasons. And, and so you can learn a lot from these things that I hung up in the heavenlies for you. And he said, you learn how to predict the weather from what I put up in heaven. He said, but you've not yet learned how to use the same things to declare unto you that my coming is at hand. Amen. How many of you are going to sit up and try to watch the star of Bethlehem? Amen. But the Bible does clearly tell us that we can learn a lot from the universe God created and there are some dangers in clinging to science over having faith in God. That's right. I mentioned that I, from a youth, I, I love astro astronomy, and I do. I love to study space. It fascinates me. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a nerd. I'm a geek. I love Star Wars. I love Star Trek. Star Trek's better. And, uh, you know, uh, scientific exploration. I, just, I love all of that. <laughs> But, uh, you know, somebody says uh, Star Wars inspires. Uh, uh, no, they said Star Wars entertains, but Star Trek inspires. Something like that. Uh, Star Trek's better. Amen. 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 But um, I live long But I recognize also that that's the devil's territory. As fascinating as it is to me, as beautiful as it is, as breathtaking as it is, as much as my imagination would like to carry me through the galaxy, warped in on the Starship Enterprise, you know, meeting new species and all of this, and as far as my imagination will take me, I know that that's the devil's domain. That's right. That's right. He was kicked out of the third heaven, and he was cast down, amen, to the earth. He can come and, and walk to and from here on the earth, and he can ascend to the second heaven. That's the devil's domain, outer space. That's right. That's right. So do we really want to know what's out there? No. Probably not. Amen. Amen. Right now, some people are saying, I don't know about that Pastor G. He's kind of a fruitcake. Go back to Hebrews chapter 11. It says, through faith we understand. That's right. That's right. Amen. So I would like to point out that there is a significant difference between astronomy and astrology. This is important. This is, this is really important. And before I even go over the, the definition and explanation of this, how many of you know the difference between astronomy and astrology? Sister Grimmett knows. 
Do you guys? It's okay if you don't know. So I, I read to you literally the textbook dictionary version of the definition of astronomy earlier. And I will go back and read it to you again. Astronomy is the study of the sun, moon, stars, planets, comets, gas, galaxies, dust, and other non-earthly bodies and phenomena. It's scientific study, observation. Now, this is what astrology is. Astrology is the pseudoscience that claims to have divine information about human affairs and terrestrial events by studying the movements and relative positions of celestial objects. Astrology is connected with witchcraft, mediums, divination, sorcery, and even necromancy. In other words, astrology is demonic and should never be participated in by any Holy Ghost or Christian. That's right. That's right. How many of you have checked your horoscope lately? Better not. <laughs> How many know your zodiac sign and what 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 month and all these things? You better not. That's that's all devil stuff. I'm just telling you. Right. Going to a, someone to read your palm and predict your future or a nominal fee? Better not. Right. Going to someone that can conjure the spirit of your great great aunt Sally. Because you want to talk to her about how she made her pound cake and you lost her recipe, so you want to ask her personally, and they're going to conjure her spirit and necromancy, you better not. <laughs> the Bible, one of these days we're going to get to it. I, I just I haven't gotten us there yet, but one of these days we are going to comb through the book of Leviticus, literally. And you're going to find that, especially in the in the, the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, there's a lot of repetitious commandments and mandates from God that prohibit and outright forbid participating in necromancy, divination, mediums, consulting witches, practicing witchcraft, talking to the dead. It's forbidden in Scripture. It's because it's demonic. That's right. Astrology is demonic. Someone's saying, well, the stars are aligned, and so that means good fortune for you. And, and so, you know, your horoscope says that you're going to meet some blue-eyed, blonde-haired, beautiful supermodel and fall in love and run off to Cancun and live happily forever after on a mansion on the beach. And, <laughs> and you're just going to wake up, and someone's going to give you $5 million and you know, and because I shared all that with you, now, what is that worth to you? $5,000? That's, that's devil worship. Because the stars and the moon and the sun didn't tell them, tell them that. You know who told them anything if they knew anything? The prince of the power of the air that resides among the, those phenomena. You're talking to the devil and these demonic spirits. That's why we should never participate in that kind of stuff. So that's the difference between astronomy and astrology. One is scientific. It's, it's learning. It's, it's learning how to interpret uh, how the sun and the moon and the stars pertain to the signs and the seasons that God told us about. Astrology is the devil trying to mess with your thinking and get you to buy into concepts that are not of God. And they're trying to tell you, oh, you know, Jill is not the right person for you. You know, she's a she, she's a monkey and you're a bear and you're not compatible. And so you need to, uh, you know, she's a Capricorn and you're a Sagittarius. And we all know that those people are really, uh, you know, just uh, killers and, and sheep's clothing and you know, serial killers, one day you wake up and she'll slit your throat. And so, I mean, all that's devil stuff, guys. Tarot cards, Ouija boards. Right. Stay away from astrology. Come on. Amen. And so, you got to be careful. Look at this, and, and, and I'm going to show you in the Word of God how to back up everything I just said. 
Isaiah chapter 47 and verse 13. The Bible says, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, not astronomers, astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators, if I ever say that, stand up and save thee from these things which shall come upon thee. God called out the astrologers in scripture and called them fakes and phonies and hypocrites. Right. He said, they can't save you. No, they can't one. do anything for you. Not a one. Now look at this. I'm going to read that same verse of scripture, verse 13 plus verse 14, this time out of the New Living Translation. All the advice you receive has made you tired. Where are all your astrologers, those stargazers who made predictions each month. Let them stand up and save you from what the future holds. But they are like straw burning in a fire. They cannot save themselves from the flame. You will get no help from them at all. Their hearth is no place to sit for warmth. God's calling out the astrologers. He's saying, stay away from all that devil worship. They can't help you. Many months ago, I was preaching, and I can't remember the, the specific message, but I started to share this testimony and, and, and I didn't because I was chasing rabbit trails. But as I was kind of finalizing my notes for tonight's Bible study, this came back to mind. There was a lady that grew up in the same church that I grew up in. And uh, she actually played, played an instrument and sang. And, and uh, she'd been raised in church her whole life. She backslid as she became an adult, kind of got out of church. She would come to church every once in a while, but really wasn't in. And she knew better. Uh, she got a divorce, got remarried. And after she was remarried, she, she really wasn't in church. She wasn't living right. And she started kind of experiencing these little bouts of depression. And let me tell you something. The Bible says that in that presence, oh, Lord, there's fullness of joy. If you're depressed, the best thing that you can do is not stay away from church. Come to church. That's right. Get into the presence of God. That's right. Because in the presence of God, there are there's joy and there's pleasures forevermore. But uh, you know, uh, some people are too blessed that they would rather be depressed. I guess you know, and so they 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 skip out on God and they stay away from church. Well, this is what she was doing, and so she was trying to kind of navigate her way through what was going on in her life. So she 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 did something that's probably a little bit foreign to you young people, and you guys probably may not. Uh, understand all of this, but uh, you know, the dinosaur uh, ancestors of the cell phones had a cord on the end. It had a tail. And it was mounted to the wall and you had to dial it like this. Wow. Yeah. And she started picking up the phone and doing this and calling these 900 numbers to talk to psychics and because she was looking for a way out of her depression and so she started talking to all these people now these people are very skilled at, at manipulating suckers I, in 2009 I had a, uh, I had a lap band put in my doctor told me that I was fat and I needed to do some support. And uh, he said he was trying to push me towards a gastric bypass, but I had a friend actually who died of that. And I was like, no, thank you. I'm not going to do that. And so I went ahead and got the lap band and it was done for me. But anyway, uh, before they would do the surgery, my insurance made me sit down with a shrink. It was a one time session. But I had to go sit before the psychiatrist. And in a 30-minute session, I don't even know if it's 30 minutes, he wanted to know my reasons for the surgery. And I kind of opened up. I said, oh, I was told I have to be here. You know, macho guys like that. You know, just, that's the way it is. I don't really want to be here, but my insurance said that I have to be here in order for them to pay the bill to do the surgery. In less than eight minutes, that dude had me in tears, bawling like a baby in a fetal position. 
And I'm telling you that on a lot of camera. These people know how to determine very quickly what makes you tick and to kind of make all your emotions come along. And once they find out what makes you tick, it's not too hard to kind of manipulate you in the way that, I'm not saying that that shrink was trying to manipulate me, I'm just saying that uh, he's a professional that is skilled at getting people to open up. And he did it like that. These people, these uh, psychics and mediums and, and all these devil-possessed uh, agents of Satan, uh, they, they're much the same way. They start asking you questions. Oh, I see a red head. Uh, is there someone with red hair in your life? Oh, you must be talking about my Aunt Susie. Yeah, yeah, that's the name that's coming to me right now, Susie. And Susie is married and has children. Am I, am I right? Yeah, she has two kids. Oh, so your Aunt Susie has got red hair and she's married and she has two kids. Yeah, but I haven't seen her in a long time. Oh, and so I'm seeing here that there's some division because you're feeling excluded because there's been some kind of uh, dividing situation in your relationship. They, they, just, they play on suckers. And people that aren't emotionally strong enough to realize you're getting suckered, they, they flock to that stuff. And so those people, I don't know if it's still that way today, but those people used to make a killing financially. And you had to dial these 900 numbers. And so this lady, she got addicted to it because the devil always gets you addicted. The devil always gets you addicted to his product, whether it's marijuana, whether it's crack cocaine, LSD, PSP, whatever it is they got on the market today, alcohol, he gets you addicted to it. And so it's the same way with divination and witchcraft and all that garbage. Uh, you know, and, and she was she was grieving over the loss of a loved one, and so she was wanting to know if they could kind of reach out to the other side and give her some kind of assurance. This was a person raised in an apostolic church. She knew better than that. She started messing around with the devil, and I'm going to tell you, to make a long story short, when you start messing around with the devil, the devil starts messing around with you. What she did was she opened a portal in her home unintentionally. She didn't realize what she was doing. And there was this giant eyeball that appeared in her bedroom and began to scare the bejesus out of her and her kids and her new husband. And in the middle of the night, as they were trying to go to sleep at night, he would appear in the bedroom as a giant eyeball, just kind of like floating, levitating in their, in, in their bedroom. And he would just stare at them with the creepiest, like with nothing, no head, no nothing, just a giant, just a giant eyeball. And it scared them, and they, 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 they were terrified, and it tormented them. And so they kept asking people to come over and anoint their house and pray and pray and pray. What brought this spirit into their house was dabbling with necromancy and mediums and witchcraft and tarot reading and, right. and psychics. And so that's why the Bible says stay away from that that's stuff. That's right. That's right. That's right. And so Isaiah tells us that... that Astrologers can't help you. Your zodiac sign, you know, uh, your your prediction is not going to help you. Those magic numbers on the back of your little Chinese fortune cookie that says, "Oh, go buy a lottery ticket with these numbers right here." How many of you have ever heard of anybody who actually went went in the lottery on that? <laughs> it's a gimmick. And so, moving on, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 again, out of the New Living Translation says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for, for it is the evidence of things we cannot see. He wants to stay with me tonight. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. The, the Good News Translation says it like this, to have faith is to be sure of the things we hope for. To be certain of the things we cannot see. So faith does not require scientific data in order for one to be convinced that something is true. That's right. That's right. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. 
For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that is a reward of those that diligently seek him. We cannot please God without faith. Amen. 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 We cannot please God without faith. That's right. If we had the time and we don't, it's five minutes till eight, and I've got to hurry through this and wrap this up here in the next few minutes. If we had the time, I could go through here and I could debunk using scripture all of these cliches that people have adopted, even in the Apostolic Pentecostal Church, where people say things like, we are all God's children. No, we're not. Not until you're born again of the water and the spirit. You're not. Once you are born again of the water and the spirit, the Bible says, to many as received him to the game, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Paul says, now are we the sons of God. Or well, what does he mean now? He says, now that you've obeyed Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Now that you've repented of your sins, been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to have your sins washed away, and you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, now are we become the sons of God. Meaning that we were not the sons of God before. That's right. Before now. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. Now, I didn't say that's what the Bible says. Paul says, now are we become. In other words, before, now, we were not the sons of God. So not everybody is God's children. That's right. And not everybody's going to heaven. That's right. Amen. You cannot please God without faith. That's right. You cannot have a good report with God without faith. That's right. And without faith, you cannot understand. That's right. Amen. So in order to come to God, we must believe that he exists and that he rewards those that diligently seek him. People are always wanting to fact check everything here in our life today. And they use science, politics, popular opinion, and the basis as their basis of measurement of truth. How many have ever been fact checked on Facebook? Yeah. Here a few months ago, a couple months ago, I posted a prayer request in our lockdown private Facebook group that has just our congregation members in it, nobody else. I put in a prayer request and I put a little news article from a mainstream news source that uh, kind of related to the prayer request and Facebook violated the privacy rights of that group because the third party fact checkers who are not part of our church and not part of that group and should not be privy to bypassing those privacy settings we're granted access to go into our private closed group and flag that as false. Saying I don't agree with it. When I, uh, when I clicked on uh, the, the flag and I scrolled all the way down to the bottom, I found that the, the third party fact checker was a lady uh, who used to be the online editor for CNN. The most liberal news network that, that there is right now. And now she, she left that position and she took another media position at a news uh, station in Georgia. So she's, she is uh, a former employee of CNN and Facebook contracted her to fact check information. Now what has CNN done over the last four years? Anything Trump says, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong. They kept saying that a vaccine w was impossible to produce before the end of 2020 and here it is. I'm not taking it, but here it is. He kept saying he was going to deliver, and he said, oh, and you know, he's not going to deliver, but here it is. They kept flagging everything he would say is false. And, and so it's like if, if, if uh, he said, don't stick a fork in an electrical socket, the Democrats would have lined up with metal forks to stick a fork in an electrical socket just because he said not to. He ought to have stood up and told everybody, do not go to church, because then he would all come to church, and our churches will be full. They did everything opposite of what he said to do because they hated him so much. That's why they cheated and stole the election. Amen. But fact-checking is the way of life here in the year 2020, and it's popular opinion. It's what's culturally appropriate. It's politics and sciences, the basis that people use for their measurement of truth. But Jesus condemned mankind for always being overly fixated on looking for a sign of evidence. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 39, Jesus said, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it. 
He said it's an evil and an adulterous generation that seeks a sign. Now, that's an interesting word, adulterous. When we think of adultery, we're thinking extramarital relationship. You know, husband cheats on wife or wife cheats on husband, something like that, right? But that's not what he's referring to here. He's saying people that are overly fixated. I'm getting ready to get some virtual stone, uh, stones tossed at me right here. But he's saying people that are so overly fixated on prophecy and signs and evidence of supernatural phenomena, he says they're adulterers. That's right. Because they're more concerned about the circus than they are about him. I'm not against prophecy, but I don't think that if you're going to go to the restroom that you need to say, thus saith the Lord, give me that roll of toilet paper, and I'm going to take care of business. But some people are so fixated on prophecy, that's what they think. Mm -hmm. He called them adulterous generation. Looking for a sign. Show us. Show us a sign. Some people see signs where no signs exist. It's like people trying to show America in the scripture. They start reading about the eagle. If you study it in proper context, you'll realize that the eagle is wrong. It's not the United States. As far as I can tell, I've read this Bible cover to cover. The United States isn't mentioned in there. Guess why? Because it's not about us. That's right. It's never been about us. Matter of fact, we were not a people and would never have been a people we probably would eventually. But we were not God's people until the Jews rejected us after Jesus came. That's right. And when they rejected him and they crucified him, he said, all right, I'm going to take a people that was not a people, and I'm going to graft them in, and I'm going to make them my people. Amen. And guess what? This dispensation of grace, this age of the Gentiles, closes at the rapture of the church, and then he's going to turn again to the Jews. Because they are still the apple of his eye. Guess what? It's not about the United States of America. That's right. The Bible's not about us. We're just like the rest of the Gentiles of the world. Outcasts, dogs, nobodies. Saved by grace. Because God took pity on a people that was no people. That's right. And made us his people. But it's never been about us. The eagle's not the United States. It's Rome. Amen. So people see signs where no signs exist. Let me tell you something. Solomon says, there's nothing new. Everybody say that with me. There's nothing new. There's nothing there's nothing new. Under where? Oh, you mean that thing God said in Genesis chapter number one was going to be for signs and seasons? They're looking for a sign. And, 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 and this is so blatantly clear, it stares them right in the face. While they're looking for a sign, they're saying, God showed me. I'm threatening. I don't even have my waiters on, but here I go. God showed me. Well, there ain't nothing new. That's right. I have a sign. That's right. That was given to you for a sign. That's right. Just say it. God showed me. Is it in the scripture? No, but God gave me a revelation. There's nothing new under the sun, which either means <laughs> that you interpret it incorrectly or you're a liar. False prophet. I'm just, that's what the Bible says, isn't it? There's nothing new under the sun. That's right. So if God showed you something and it contradicts his written word, God didn't show you that. Amen. It did not come from God. That's right. God's not going to give you a dream. He's not going to give you a vision. He's not going to visit you in the night and whisper little things in your ear that contradict his word. That's right. Amen. If you've got a revelation that contradicts the word of God, it did not come from God. That's right. Amen. You might be so fixated on looking for a sign that you convince yourself it was God speaking to you, but maybe you ate too many tacos too close to bedtime, <laughs> and uh, that chemical reaction in your digestive system started messing with your chemical activity in your brain, and you started dreaming of big tacos flying in the sky, and uh, you saw that as a sign of uh, more border security. I don't know. <laughs> but it didn't come from God. Yep. 
Amen? Some people are so fixated on looking for evidence of signs, and sometimes the signs are not there. Because Jesus said, uh, people that are so overly fixated on looking for this stuff, they're evil and they're adulterous. Because they're fixated on stuff like that rather than in focus on their walk and relationship with God. Amen. Now, is that what the Bible says? <laughs> That's, right. That's all you guys are going to remember is like the blind taco and the cow. <laughs> <Damn. Lord. laughs> the faith of some people, I'm hurrying to a close, isn't faith at all. If they can't see it or touch it, they reject it as truth. Thomas, who was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, he refused to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. The other disciples stood there and told him, they said, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. He's back. He rose from the dead. He appeared unto us. He spoke to us. And Thomas, Thomas refused to believe it. Thomas said this in John chapter 20, verse 25. Except I see in his hands the print of nails and put my finger into the print of nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And what's that sound like? I've got to see it and I've got to touch it in order to believe it. That's right. Wow. Isn't that the way the science community thinks? That's true. Right. If I can't observe it physically, visually, and I, I can't actually look at it, and if I can't actually touch it, if I can't experiment with the characteristics of touch, taste, and smell, and texture, and all that stuff, you know, then I'm not going to believe it. That's why they call God an imaginary friend in the sky, because they can't see him. Oh, but through faith, you can touch him. The Bible says he's not very far from any one of us. Amen. But Thomas refused to believe, and so Jesus rebuked him for his unbelief. In verse 27, he tells Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Amen. He said it's not about the sign. It's not about uh, being able to physically and visually uh, observe something. It's not about the, the things that you can see. It's about the things you can't see. That's faith. Amen. Amen. He says we are not called to walk by science, but we're called to walk by faith. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Jesus said in Mark 5 and 36, Be not afraid, only Believe. So the scriptures speak of different levels of faith, and give me about five minutes, and we're 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 almost there. Okay, this giant taco in the sky is coming in early. <laughs> Amen. Crunch wrap. Matthew five and verse twenty-eight. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith; be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So here we find great faith. Jesus describes this woman's level of faith as being great. It was great faith. Okay? Matthew chapter 6 and verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So here is another category of faith. Little faith. Some people have great faith, and other people have little faith. Look at this, Mark chapter 4 and verse number 40. You definitely want to, don't want to be in this category. And he's, he's rebuking his disciples here, his 12 disciples. He said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? <laughs> Man, he just torched the 12. <laughs> He says, you guys have no faith. That's right. So the one woman, she had great faith. The other, he says, little faith. And now he's telling his disciples, you guys have no faith. Three different levels of faith. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 19, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. 
For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. So this kind of faith that we need to experience and witness the supernatural, it comes only through prayer and fasting. There's no other way to get it. Now, Jesus said that armed with this kind of faith, nothing is impossible. Literally nothing. But you can only have this kind of faith through prayer and fasting. A lot of people, when they, they focus on what I just read there, they focus on the fact that Jesus is referencing a grain of a mustard seed. And tying that into faith. And they say, all you need is just a little bit of faith. Yes and no. Depends on what you want to do. That's right. If you want to come to the Lord, you've got to believe that he is. And a little bit of faith can get you there. That's right. And you need to believe that he's a rewarder of those that diligently see him. A little bit of faith might get you there. That's right. But you might find yourself on a ship in the middle of a storm, in the middle of a trial of life that you don't know what to do and that little bit of faith ain't going to get you there. That's right. It, it, it can actually almost be camouflaged as having no faith because your faith is overshadowed by fear. And fear is an absence of love. And not having love is an absence of relationship, meaning that we're not praying and fasting the way that we should be. That's right. But if we have prayer and fasting as a discipline in our life, then we have an overcoming kind of faith. Now back to this grain of mustard seed. A lot of people say all we need is a tiny bit of faith. Well, it, yes and no. It depends on what you want to do. It really does. Depends on what you want to do. If you want to cast out devils in his name, a little bit of faith ain't going to get you there. Because they were trying to cast out a devil and they said, we can't. Why? Because the giant taco would have gotten all the way anyway. He said, you're not praying faster. But you said, how can we fast while the bridegroom is with us, Lord? You haven't even taught us how to fast yet. So that's not a fair test. He's like, well, I'm, I'm just trying to set the example for you and generations to follow that y'all understand that there's a certain kind of faith that is required to meet special needs. And the supernatural will only occur in, in atmospheres where people are praying and fasting. And if we're not praying and fasting, we are not going to have the supernatural. That's right. So, Mark chapter 4, I'm almost finished, I promise, verse number 30, talking about this mustard seed and how it compares to faith. Jesus, and he said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of a mustard seed. Everyone say, say a mustard seed. Mustard seed. Which, when it is sown in the earth, is less than all seeds that be in the earth. That's where everyone stops. They say it's just a small thing. That's all that we need. But you're missing the point and the intent and the purpose of the seed. It says, when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. So here's the, here's the lesson that we're supposed to learn from this mustard seed. The mustard seed, mustard seed is supposed to grow into a big tree. Right. It's not supposed to stay a little seed. That's right. So when we sing that song, you don't need a whole lot, just use what you got. Just, just a little bit of faith. Just, just cling on to that super glue into your fingers. That's all you need to go through life. It depends on what you want to do. If you want to come to the Lord... And believe that he is, you know, maybe even come to salvation, that little bit of faith might get you there. But if you're wanting to cast out devils in his name and see blinded eyes open and deaf ears unstopped, the dead raised, and the lepers cleansed and cancer healed, and see the supernatural, a little bit of faith ain't gonna get you there. You've got to do some prayer and fasting. And then this mustard seed level faith is supposed to grow and grow and grow and shoot out large branches 
And so uh, he, he's talking about this, this faith is supposed to continually grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And so if you're a stagnant Christian that holds on, if you received the Holy Ghost 50 years ago and you're still carrying around a little bit of faith and that's all you got, you're not growing. That's right. And you've missed the whole point. That's right. Because we're not called to be a mustard seed. We're called to be a tree. That's right. In the kingdom of God. We're supposed to use our faith, exercise our faith, and let it continually grow. Amen. Amen? Amen. Faith is supposed to grow, and it does so through the continual discipline of prayer and fasting. Now look at this, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, whereby are given in us exceeding and great precious promises. How many want to receive the promises of God? Amen. That by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, charity, for if these things be in you and Abound. Somebody say abound. abound. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Going back to what I said in the beginning of this Bible study tonight. It is the will of God for us to come to the knowledge of truth. How do we get there? You can't stick with just a little bit of faith. Yeah. That, that can be your start place. It can. And for most people it is. But that's not what you're supposed to say. You're supposed to learn how to trust him with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. This, this flawed faith concept that I'm talking about here tonight. It's saying I trust God, but you don't really. It's only in verbal affirmation. But in action and deed, you're overshadowed by fear and doubt. Because you can't see it. You can't make sense of it. You can't feel it. You can't touch it. You can't taste it. You can't apply the scientific medicine. A method you can't fix it, you know, and so it just feels overwhelming and out of control, and and you, you can't trust God. You're just walking in a condition of fear, and 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 so your faith is not being exercised. But the Bible says, "Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding." We're supposed to take that little bit of faith and start stretching it, and start trusting God. And start exercising and start utilizing it. And as we do that, it will begin to grow. And it will begin to grow. And it will begin to grow. And that grain of a mustard seed, it will spring up into a big tree, large branches. And then we're going to really get somewhere. That's right. Mm -hmm. So model this up. What is flawed faith? Flawed faith is faith that isn't exercised to trust God and God's word. Flawed faith is faith that does not grow. Flawed faith is putting one's confidence in science, theories, and algorithms rather than trusting the promises of God. But let us all endeavor to follow the advice of Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 11, verse 22. Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Amen. My challenge to us tonight as we're getting ready to pray, and we're going to dismiss here momentarily. Amen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you're going to follow God, if you're truly going to follow God, if you're going to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ, you've got to learn how to navigate in the unseen. You've got to learn how to operate in things that you can't figure out, and things that you don't know what to do things that you can't fix and, and, and comprehend and make sense of. Faith is just knowing that he is. And he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So when you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, know this. The psalmist said, thou art with me. Amen. You've got to know, even though you may not see him, you've got to know he's there. Because his word promises he's there. That's, right. That's faith. Someone says, show me your imaginary friend in the sky. I can't do that today, but one day you shall see him, right. and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess right. that Jesus Christ right. is Lord. But I would rather walk by faith today and hold true the promises of God in my heart and my life. Amen. And allow God to use me 
here and now in this present world. But flawed faith, and there's a lot of it in the apostolic church. There really is. Flawed faith is only being willing to go so far in trusting God. And then you just stagnate. Because you give in to fear, you give in to doubt, you give in to unbelief. You start looking at what Fox News and CNN and MSNBC are saying. And, and so it, it begins to cast doubt in your mind where you're doubting the promises of God. That's flawed faith. But the Bible says, faith, you can't see it. But through faith, we understand. Through faith, we understand. Amen. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads here tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your great grace. I pray, Lord, that something that's been said here tonight has been a help, Lord. I pray that the seed from your word has been sown into hearts that are good soil. I pray, Lord, that it would impact our hearts and lives and that we would leave this place tonight, Lord, with something to chew on and meditate on and think about for days to come. I pray, God, that you would begin to develop in us, Lord, a more perfect faith. Take us, Lord, from a place, Lord, of little faith to where we get to a place of great faith. Lord, that we can trust you, Lord, with all our heart and lean not to our own understanding, God, but to trust you, Lord, that you have us in the palm of your hand. Lead us and guide us, O oh God. Bless Great Plains Apostolic Church. Bless every family, every member of this congregation. Give us mighty revival, Lord. And we give you all the praise and all the glory, all the honor in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Come back Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Amen. We'll worship the Lord together in Jesus' name.